Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. I hope everyone's having a great holiday seasons as 2020 is finally ending. And here at the channel, we're continuing our celebration of the 12 Days of Christmas special, featuring 12 different top 5 lists for the game Total War 3 Kingdoms. And today we're going to be doing the top 5 new mechanics that I want to see added to the game. Now this video is going to be quite similar to the one tomorrow, which is the top 5 changes I want to see added to the game. And the difference between these are today's list will involve some mechanics that are currently not in the game at all that I want to see added. And tomorrow are mechanics that are already in the game that I want to see tweaked or changed to make better. So with that in mind, we'll start our list with the first thing I want to see added to the game, and that is provinces. So I believe the developer is already moving toward this direction, as we have seen a couple of patch notes, I believe 1.5 where they actually listed out each of the provinces and which commanderies would go with which, as well as mentioning what starting population each of these provinces had during 190 from a historical perspective and modifying the population and the land fertilities of those commanderies within those provinces. I believe this can be expanded farther in the game to the point where eventually we have entire provinces. And if we take a look at this map here, we can see that during the Han Dynasty, there was a total of 13 provinces, and these eventually shifted and changed by a little bit, but overall, this was the general structure, and you have some famous ones like Jingzhou in the middle there, uh, towards the bottom, and all these are kind of mentioned in the game. You see some reference to them, whether through a unit or whether through a commandery name, perhaps Yuzhou, you have Yu Beiping, which is Beiping in Yu, and then you have Infantry of Jin for Jinzhou, you have the Xu Raiders for Xuzhou, and you have some that are missing. For example, the Flying Riders that were introduced for Lu Bu's faction are actually Binzhou's cavalry. And then you have the Xi Liang cavalry, which is Liangzhou's cavalry. You have the Yi Archers, which are archers from the Yi province. And Cao Cao technically should have a mixed yellow turban unit called Qingzhou Bing, and that's from the Qingzhou province in the Shandong Peninsula area. And these can all be better implemented into the game if the provinces actually exist and are acknowledged. And you can simply add an inspector or prefix role that kind of governs above the administrators, which would be the governing faction of a commandery. And then you have a governing official for the provinces with a province bonus, which is quite common in a lot of Total War games. There are rewards for collecting different settlements that make up a province in other Total War games that kind of became commandery bonuses, which is similar. Understand that you now have four pieces to one commandery and commandery becomes the largest unit of settlements on the game map. You could expand that one level farther and have a province level um, separation for the game and additional bonuses should you click the whole province even if the bonus is just allowing you to put in an inspector or put in a governor for that entire uh, province and that would give you additional bonuses if you collected the entirety of the province and that would give something for players to work towards to improve economy to allow you to play tall in certain regions of the map that might otherwise be less beneficial like for example if you have the Liang province the entirety of it perhaps your bonus is more cavalry related or military related and you have the entirety of the Ji province in the north in the middle there you could potentially have more agricultural bonuses because that was a big breadbasket in the region and so forth and you can definitely play around the idea with provincial troops e archers could be still Liu Bei's special unit but if you own all of the E province, you can gain access to that unit as well, which would make a lot more sense in my mind. So those are just some ideas here with provinces. I would love to see this being implemented. And it's one of those changes which I don't think is that hard to implement since the map's ready there. You just have to subdivide it one more time. Then moving on to our second new mechanic, I want to see non-deployable children. So what I mean by this is obviously children in the game do exist already, but you can't interact with them at all from age zero when they're born or even when your wife is pregnant. You have no idea that the female character in the game is pregnant. There is no trait that pops up that tells that they're pregnant. 
there is no notifications, just suddenly you have a zero year old that was born. And then that zero year old is going to have to spend the next 90 turns, or in the best case scenario from then to heaven, 80 turns where you come of age at 16 or 18, where you can't see them at all in the game. You can't find them on the menus. You can only see them on the family tree as a little icon. You can't interact with them. There is nothing you can do with them. I think that can be improved and made more interesting to give you more engagement during that period. Whereas kids right now is just kind of a throwaway thing because when they come of age, you know, they're just a generic character. So by turn 100 in your game, you suddenly have a bunch of kids start popping out and you don't even know their names because you never looked at them. So what the game could really do here is make them non-deployable, which was a concept that was already added in during Mandate of Heaven with the Unix and Emperor Liu Hong and Empress uh, He, because you don't want these characters on the battlefield, therefore you have to make them non-deployable. Same thing with kids, you can do the same exact idea. You just have to make a separate class of kid characters and just have the kid being born classless without any traits. That way, as you have the kid progress, maybe design a unique kid skill tree where you can end up classing into one of the five classes and gain traits along the way with maybe special assignments that are only available to the kids. So you still have to sacrifice your gameplay slot to develop your kid, but the reward is a character that is worth using and someone that you have been interacting with during the entire 90 turns that they're kind of incubating on the side. Therefore, you can handpick their traits, you can handpick their skills, handpick their class, make changes to their stats, and also engage them with various assignments so that they can gain levels as well as kind of use those skills perhaps to trigger the events that will find you your undiscovered trait. And we kind of already seen some of this implemented in 182's Mandate of Heaven with Liu Bei with his undiscovered trait at the beginning with story scripted events that pop up where you can pick traits. You can simply do something like that. I understand it will be a large undertaking because you have to try to incorporate all the traits for your characters and you have to have generic stories created for all those. But I think even if they made this a DLC, I think a lot of people will kind of see this as a semi-character creator where you can play second generation kids, that's something you created along the way, even if the artwork is more generic. And speaking of artworks, we'll talk about that at the end of this video here, as that's another point that we will make. And then moving forward for the third point, we have follower and accessory buildings. So one of the biggest changes that happened, I believe patch 1.4 or 1.5, is that we had forge buildings become craft buildings. They can start spawning weapons, bows, armors, and that really helped the game because you now had access to these very essential items for all your generals because generals power level are pretty basic until they get a good weapon or a good armor. Otherwise, they're all fairly weak. And if you give a legendary character, say Lu Bu, a very simple common weapon, and you give a generic character Lu Bu's weapon, the generic character wins every time because the power is not within the character themselves, but rather with the weapons and armors that they have equipped. So by allowing you to create buildings that can spawn non-unique items, understand that's still a factor. You can't use a forge building to get gold items, and that's fine because there's only one copy of gold items in the game at one time. It's called unique for a reason. But for followers and accessory items, which are non-essential items, they don't really make your general, or at least they don't make or break your general. They still make your generals great uh, in many ways. And you can definitely add another layer of building choices with these items. So two things come to mind. First, the school building can spawn follower items. That would make sense. A lot of the follower items are government officials or are traders, merchants, scholars, mathematicians, and they all seem to fit as character that could spawn from hosting schools. Whether they're people you educate or attract because you have a, an academy in your commandery, that all makes sense. So just by having a school building that can spawn followers from time to time, with a set spawn chance and increased rarity based on the level of your school buildings, 
you can encourage the construction of more school buildings right now. Because right now, commanderies fit basically three uses. Income commanderies, food commanderies, and utility commanderies. And within utility commanderies, the main utility that you're looking for is usually military. So you're more or less building conscription buildings to get seasonal deployment limit increases or deployment discounts, or you're building the forge building to get items. Now, if you allow your school buildings to spawn followers, I'm sure that would be a very popular choice as well as one of those utility options you could pursue. Because right now, if you're going to sacrifice the chance to get items or the chance to spawn more armies cheaply or the ability to just gain some character experience, I don't think anyone's taking that, especially since there's an upkeep cost to school buildings as well. So if you modify that where they can spawn followers, I think that will make another strategic choice when you decide what to build and also make gameplay more interesting as you have more followers to play around with as your roster expand into the late game. Then for the accessory item, I think the building of choice here would be the toolmaker counties. Now, right now, the toolmaker counties are pretty good buildings. They give you a large amount of income, 500 industry for one option. The other option is a little bit less, but you get trade influence, I believe. I don't recall exactly off the top of my head, but I think if you can lower the income of the toolmaker and increase the chance of spawning accessory items or just change the two branches where you have one branch focus entirely on income like you have right now. And then the other branch, once you part ways at level three, you stop gaining income at all, but instead you gain increased chance to spawn accessory items. And even if you can't spawn the gold ones like what we have seen, or perhaps allow them to spawn gold ones because weaponsmith, armorsmith, and animal tamers can spawn gold ones just low chance there. You can have Toolmaker level five have a low chance to spawn gold ones, while the others have a increased chance to spawn increased rarity based on their rank. So level three may be mostly bronze and common items. Once you get level four, mostly bronze and some silver. Once you get to level five, very rare chance for gold, pretty common to get silver, and then very easy to get the refined and the common items. And that would be a great way to use tool makers and make them very valuable in the game. Because right now, tool makers, you just look at them, look at the commandery, see if there's a complementary piece of another industry company, or perhaps a harbor, so you can complement commerce with the tool maker, or if it's kind of a peasantry plus a industry building, maybe you slap a champion there for population growth, and then you build some tax collection, go for the peasantry industry one, which is a little weird, but still doable. If you have this as a more item spawning one, people would definitely keep it. People might even just keep this county and then give away the rest of the commandery if they don't need it for food. As the case with many of the tool makers on the map, it's usually paired with some sort of farmland commandery. And that way you can make a vassal in the rest of the commandery and then keep the tool maker for yourself just there to spawn items where the income portion is taken away by choice. And that would be you know, another strategic choice the player can make about certain buildings. So these are just some changes to increase the amount of items that's available in the game. Since the items diplomatic value have been largely nerfed, I don't think it's going to hurt gameplay as much because after the last patch where most items got their diplomatic value halved and you still can only trade four item in any given trade, it really limits the amount of points you can create diplomatically with these items. Therefore, I think they should open up the amount of items you can receive in a campaign, especially these accessory items, which have so many varieties that you don't get to see and you need them to complete many of the item set bonuses, which so many players do not get to enjoy. And then moving on to our fourth point, this is one worth repeating. We talked about this in yesterday's episode when we talked about new units. And this is really about naval battles. Right now, we don't have naval battles at all. We have naval delegates that everyone's really fearful of because when the AI engages you, you know they know they can win, right? You know they know that they have won this delegate battle. Therefore, they are attacking your navy army with their navy army. And the auto battles or the delegate battles in the game can really be skewed towards more of a rock, paper, scissors style, where even if you have, say, insane cataphracts and the enemy just have a whole army of Z militias, they're likely to get more delegate value than you are. 
or say your level 10 trebuchets that will absolutely wreck infantry but if you put them up in a delegate battle against massive amount of infantry you're doomed so in that case you often stayed away from these rivers or at least you got in and got out got in and got out every turn just to make sure your army isn't caught by surprise they could fix this very easily as i mentioned if they just create a new type of map and the image that we're using here is from dynasty warrior 3 for those of you who play this back in the day and what they did was they mimicked the battle of tribute where Cao Cao's navy was chained together in his port with this kind of a maze of ships and we mentioned this yesterday's video when I introduced two potential naval units. What you can do is have these giant ship platforms on opposite side of a river map and have more mobile, smaller platforms that you can move around in between these two large platforms so that the enemy archers can't just come up to your main platform, fire fire arrows at it and burn it down and have it sink. That way you have kind of buffers where you have to defend yourself from such attacks and also make fire arrows a lot stronger for naval engagement, which was, you know, true to history. Because if your ship does burn down, they burn down. And you can also introduce the idea of marine units or navy units where if the ship sink and they fall into the river, they don't die right away. Let's say you take a cavalry unit that's stored on a ship and you burn the ship down, the cavalry unit would just sink and all die. And that's a concept you can play around with and you can have strategic elements of how you want to move your ships as platforms to attack enemy positions. Or perhaps you're just in a pure defensive position where you have small ship surrounding your large platforms, kind of like a carrier formation where you're just deflecting enemy blows as they try to invade your formation. And it can make for some very interesting battles. You can even add some land elements around the side where you can land your troop on one side of the river per se to flank the enemy platform it can be a mix between an open field and siege battle it'll be a lot more interesting than the auto delegates that we are getting right now so that's just another idea to reinforce a big change that i would potentially want to see and it would make this type of battle a lot of fun assuming you can get the ai to behave in a sensible manner then finally, wrapping up this video, we have our fifth point, which is armor inheritance. This has to be linked with our discussion about making the children interactable. Here, what we have is a bunch of unique characters, and they have beautiful artworks for their armor, as you can see here. There are a lot more armor than this in the game. I just did enough to fill out the board. And what we have is once they die, the armor is bounded to them. Therefore, the armor disappears from the game. Now, artwork in the game works two ways, as we can tell when you swap armors on generic characters. There are the armor art, and there are the character art. So, wouldn't it be nice if your character, who is unique, has a kid, and when your character dies, the armor becomes unbounded and is passed on to one of your kids. Your kid will still look like a generic character, but they will get the armor piece overlapped on their character as their art so you kind of have your main characters stay alive in a sense at least through the artwork going forward in future generations or else you're constantly wasting artwork in my opinion now of course some of these artwork has uh, helmet elements attached and it could be kind of weird with generic heads but i'm sure that's something you can tweak and work out and if you combine this with our idea of making children's kind of moldable when you have them where they're classless and they have no traits and everything you can kind of develop them to become the second you or the second legendary character that you're kind of breeding them from and therefore if you have let's say Lu Bu's armor that you know will boost a lot of instinct you can kind of mold your kid into a vanguard to take advantage of that or if you know your armor gives fatigue immunity or if your armor gives unbreakable you might take advantage of that with how you want to build out your kid as they're growing up and you know that your kid will stand out and look great once they come of age or once the parent died at least because once they come of age the parent's still alive you wouldn't pass on the armor but you know the armor is there waiting for them and only one the kid would get it so it's not like you're duplicating a lot of this once the parent die from his kids one of them can get the armor and that's a very minor change i think and I'll just keep the game a little bit more interesting to not waste so many great assets that they have created so 
with that, that's all the five mechanics that I want to see added to the game. Come back tomorrow where we talk about five changes that will feel kind of like this video, but there will be more minor changes to existing mechanic where I think I can make them a little bit better and more fun for the game. So I hope you guys enjoy this one and I'll see you guys then. Bye.